The third annual Hellfire Gala is upon us, but this is no time for frivolity, this is no time for celebration, because this is the beginning of the fall of the House of X. How will it happen? Who will live and who will die? Well, let's hop into the pages of X-Men Hellfire Gala issue number one and find out together, shall we? Alrighty then, so a literal million things happen in this issue, so try and bear with me on this one as I try and cover it all. First things first, the long-awaited and much-touted resurrection of Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, well, I say long-awaited, despite the fact that she's only been dead for, like, what, a month and some change? But wait, there's more. Turns out Emma Frost, the White Queen, had actually discovered ten weeks ago that Kamala is no simple inhuman, she is actually an inhuman mutant hybrid. One that Cerebro only picked up on just recently, and I know what you're probably thinking, wait, isn't there a precedent already stated for mutant inhuman hybrids? Uh, yes, but also shut the hell up. Understandably, Kamala is pretty stoked at the idea of being alive again, but turns out the White Queen didn't do all of this out of the kindness of her heart or even to placate her lover Scott. Oh no no. Emma needs a big PR win this year for her fancy Hellfire Gala party and because everyone liked Ms. Marvel and everyone agreed her death was bullshit, bringing her back to life and revealing her as a mutant seems like a pretty good idea. This comic also asks a pretty interesting question too and that is that if in beginning was Kamala's inhuman power then is that to say that she'll probably manifest a mutant power soon too? Either way, though, she gets to be the belle of the ball for the night, and after everything she had to suffer in that Spider-Man book, in my mind, she really deserves it. Now, what is the theme for the Hellfire Gala this year? Well, friendship and communication. The X-Men are doing everything they can to try and combat Orchis's brand new empowered blitz of propaganda and misinformation against them and their medicine right now. So this night really needs to go off without a hitch. We see the guests begin to file into the Hellfire Company's protectorate island from all over the superhero world and beyond. But right away, things seem to be a little fishy. Scott Cyclops ends up getting called away because an alarm was raised at the treehouse in New York. And that's just where things begin. We actually get a series of small little vignettes where we get to see what all of the different mutants are doing right now and how these events could probably be spun off into new series. We're reminded that Forge was working on smart living cities to try and deal with the housing crisis. Stuff you'd probably know if you were paying attention to the main X-Men book, but perhaps one of the most unexpected and surprising guests at this party is Wynn. Who is Wynn? Well, he's the, the newest creation of Jonathan Hickman, the man who helped launch this era of X-Men and who is now launching a brand new series off the back of this. That book is called Gods. And Wynn here claims to actually work for some of the more powerful cosmic beings in the Marvel Universe. In fact, he only came because he heard that Magneto had said back when this whole series began that mutant kind are the new gods of Earth. We check in with Sam Wilson and some of the other Avengers. Understandably, Cap doesn't love the idea of Wilson Fist the Kingpin getting a second chance here on the island considering all the horrible crimes he committed, though admittedly some of the mutants admit that this isn't a terrible fate for him. Stuck on an island with no money and nothing but heroes to watch over him and see what he's doing at any given moment. Also, he's dressed like some old corrupt Roman emperor, which is just so very, very Kingpin, if you ask me. The rest of the Avengers, in including a newly reactivated rogue also end up getting called away from the party to deal with a threat in DC. Apparently someone tried to assassinate Steve Rogers and it looks like all hands on deck right now. Again, if you didn't know, this is actually going to be spinning out into the newly resurrected Uncanny Avengers team book starting soon. It also wouldn't be a Hellfire Gala without a big reveal of the brand new X-Men team that we're going to be following in the main X-Men book and oh boy was there some eclectic picks this year. Juggernaut, Dazzler, Cannonball, even Jubilee and Prodigy. Boy, what an astonishing team of X-Men this would make. I say would because at that very moment Nimrod ends up Halo jumping from space and turning the entire team into Red Mist. Ah, so that's why I don't remember there being an X-Men fan vote this year. Makes sense. Honestly, I'm not gonna lie. That was probably one of the best page turn reveals I've seen in a long time and it all starts going downhill after that. Again, if you've been reading all the different X-Men books, you'll know full well that Orchis has spent years planning this attack, building their war war chest, controlling the media message about mutants being evil and their medicine being dangerous. With the party under attack, Omega-level mutants like Magic and Iceman spring into action. They fight valiantly, but unfortunately Orchis has countermeasures for them too, knowing full well that if they deal with the Omega-level mutants first, the rest of mutant kind will be much more easy to pacify. Orchis's real ace in the whole weapon, though, are the brand new Stark Sentinels provided by Fei Long. They managed to cover the whole island, and you'll remember 
remember in the last main issue of X-Men, it essentially took the whole team to bring down just one. So understandably, fighting a whole army is an uphill battle even for such a powerful gathering of mutants. It's here now that Dr. Stasis, along with Omega Sentinel, who is actually the real power behind Orchis, a fact of which I feel always ends up getting lost in the sauce, make their grand appearance at the party. This big attack, this whole siege is actually just appetizer. The main course Orchis has cooked up is something even more horrible. You see, as Dr. Stasis explains to Xavier, mutant kind was so worried about fixing their own resurrection protocols and whether or not Mr. Sinister had managed to corrupt them, they weren't keeping a close eye on their life-saving human medicine. You see, Stasis, with the help of MODOK, has actually managed to taint all of the brand new mutant medicine, meaning that any human who hears a particular Orchis signal will go blood murder crazy at the drop of a hat. Meaning that essentially Orchis is now holding most of humanity hostage and threatening to kill them all unless Charles and Mutant Kind are willing to play ball with them, once again showing that despite their high-minded human superiority, Orchis never actually cared about humankind. They just hated mutants and wanted to see their success stopped at any cost. Even the mutants' gate technology ends up getting turned against them, thanks to some purchased secrets from eco-terrorist group Horticulture. It's in all this chaos and uncertainty Jean Grey actually rises to the occasion to rally the rest of mutant kind to fight back, which is interesting considering her and Scott had finally stepped down from the X-Men team, and yet here she is being the savior once again. Jean really goes all out in this battle too, even using her telepathy to freeze all of the different combatants in place. She tries to find some manner of peaceful parley only to end up literally getting stabbed in the back by Robo Moira McTaggart. Moira was actually just coming back from the mutant's treehouse base where she had already ambushed Cyclops, and because she's a robot with a robot brain, Jean couldn't read her mind and know she was getting snuck up on. The blade she got stabbed with too also isn't any regular run-of-the-mill knife either, it's a poisoned otherworld blade. Charles, seeing that everything is going all tits up all around him, actually makes the knee-jerk reaction to surrender to Orchis and agree to all their terms. What are those terms? Well, all mutants will abandon Earth right now, through the portals, and if Orchis catches any mutants running around, they'll be sure to kill a human for every mutant left behind. Xavier knows his mutants are a proud people and would happily stand and fight to the last man, so he has to push them psychically with his powers. Jean isn't amongst these mutants, though, because, well, she's dying, and with her last ounce of psychic strength, she actually ends up tricking Dr. Stasis into thinking Firestar was always an undercover agent of Orchis. Jean is putting a hell of a lot of faith into Angelica right now, but she figures that, hey, most of mutant kind was distrustful of her when she became an X-Men in the first place, feeling that her loyalties lied on the Avengers. So if anyone would make a believable mole, it would be her. Also, damn, talk about one a hell of, of a promotion and story importance all at once, am I right? Now, while most rank-and-file mutants end up falling under the sway of Xavier's mind powers, not everyone is susceptible to it. Some of the most important X-Men characters are able to resist, mainly because they've trained their minds over the years, to repel this sort of psychic invasion for safety reasons, and thank God they did, too. Because no one actually knows where those portals are going. Jean says that this essentially means that every remaining mutant on Earth is now officially an X-Men, and that they're all going to have to come together if they ever want to fight back against Orchis and reclaim their home. You might also be wondering where Wolverine's been during all of this. Well, he shows up fashionably late and in costume, and once he sees that Jean has been killed, he flies into a full-on berserker barrage, taking out as many Orchis henchmen as he can. What about some of the other really important players in the Krakoan era? Well, Exodus just barely manages to save the five who wanted to stay behind and fight, despite how important they are to mutant resurrection. Though, with the hatchery gone, you have to wonder if they will actually be able to resurrect anyone who was killed here today. Mystique also violently tries to resist Charles's psychic influence, only to have a seizure and fall off a cliff, presumably to her death. Though, let's face it, it's Mystique. She always has a way of bouncing back, and we don't actually see her body, so, you know, no body, no death. It's actually Lourdes of the Hellfire Club, who proves to be the real MVP in all of this, using her power to teleport all the free mutants away to the ruins of the old New York Hellfire Club before eventually succumbing to her own injuries. Kingpin also tagged along for the ride, too. He was trying to defend his mutant wife, Typhoid Mary, and now he can't seem to find her, meaning that there's a good chance she's gone, too. A vengeful Emma desperately tries to lead a force of mutants back to retake the gala. Unfortunately, thanks to MODOK's meddling, all of mutant kind are now officially locked out of the gate network, meaning if they want to travel, they're going to have to do it the old-fashioned 
old-fashioned way. You also might be wondering, hey, weren't there a lot of humans left at that party? Important politicians and captains of industry, what about them? Well, Orchis indiscriminately murders them all, just to make sure there's no witnesses to their evil doing, and just to drag the mutant's name through the mud a little bit more before they're done. It's actually Robo Moira who wants to deal the final killing blow to Xavier himself, and I mean, it's fitting this whole era started with the two of them, so why shouldn't it end with them? Before she does go to work, though, Moira goes out of her way to gloat and list off Krakoa's many failures over the years, all the shortcomings. Everything Xavier could have stopped but was too weak and stupid to do so. Before she can actually end Xavier's life, though, she ends up getting blown into a million pieces by the return of Rogue. This actually tracking very nicely to the last issue of the main X-Men book where Destiny, one of Rogue's mom, said that she would be very important in the coming battle. And now we actually know why. Rogue spirits Charles away from all the killing and all the disaster, but he doesn't actually want to escape just yet. He wants to see what became of the main Krakoa Island. And here's the thing, the island is gone, completely stolen from the sea thanks to Mother Righteous's magic and stored in one of her lanterns. Yes, everything Xavier has built over the entire Krakoa era is crumbling all around him. But the worst is actually saved for last. Remember I said no one actually knew where those Orch's portals were going? Well, when Xavier tries to reach out and hear what became of all the mutants he forced to leave with his powers, well, he doesn't hear them anymore, meaning that they are almost certainly dead, and that this new mutant massacre is 100% Xavier's fault as the comic comes to a close. And so, that was X-Men Hellfire Gala issue number one, everybody, and oh man, oh man, never has reading a comic felt more like running a marathon before than this one right here. Literally every page had something happening on it. Every line of dialogue or interaction was either paying something off from one of the dozens of ongoing X-Men books right now, or setting up a brand new spin-off that we're going to be reading in Fall of X. Was it good? Yeah. Was it exciting? Most definitely. Do I ever want to read this particular issue again? No. This was so much to take in all at once. I will say, though, when they meant Fall of X, they were not screwing around. They most definitely came to play. And if seeing Hickman and his collaborators build up Krakoa and build up this era of X-Men stories was fun and exciting, then getting to see Gillen and company tear it all down is also fun and exciting in its own macabre, perverse kind of way. They certainly aren't playing it safe, and this late in the game, I think that's something of a godsend. Overall, I would give this one a very positive 8.5 out of 10. If you care about X-Men at all, this is certainly a must-read, which is something I feel I haven't been saying a lot about new X-Men stories, and it's probably the highest bit of praise I can give it.